Mother of Peace. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Chapter 3. The Marriage Supper of the Lamb Chapter 3 Part 1. The True Meaning of Sacrifice My mother officially joined the Unification Church in Seoul on December 15, 1955. Early in the following year, a small yet historic first step, was made as the Chuncheon Unification Church, convened its first public Sunday service at a home in Yaksadong. I was a young girl of 13, who had just graduated from Bongi Elementary School. One day when the sun was shining brightly, my mother said to me, let's go to Seoul for the day. Without knowing why we were going, I followed her. That was the day I first met Father Moon. Chongpa Dong Church, where we met, was a small, two-story wooden house. The Korean government had categorized it as enemy property, because it had been owned by the Japanese, during their occupation of our country. It was more like a home than a church. I greeted Father Moon politely, and as he returned the greeting, he asked my mother, who is this child? This is my daughter, she replied. With a look of surprise, Father Moon gazed at me as he said to my mother, You have such a pretty daughter. He then closed his eyes as if in meditation and asked my name. I politely replied, My name is Hak Jahan. As if struck by something, Father Moon spoke very softly to himself, Hak Jahan has been born in Korea. Hak Jahan has been born in Korea. Hak Jahan has been born in Korea. After saying this three times, he began expressing gratitude to God, saying, You sent such a magnificent daughter, named Hak Jahan, to Korea. Thank you. Then Father Moon spoke to me as if he were asking me to gather my resolve, Hak Jahan, you will need to make sacrifices in the future. Yes. I replied, surprised at my own forwardness. On the way home on the train, my mother and I thought the encounter was curious. How strange, she said. Why would he repeat that you were born in Korea three times? As we fell into silence, I contemplated the word sacrifice. The word Father Moon used took on a meaning different from what I had learned in textbooks. What he was alluding to was a higher dimension of sacrifice, a nobler and more complete sacrifice. What you sacrifice is important, but why you make that sacrifice is even more important. As I listened to the rhythmic rumble of the train, and looked out the window at the scenery as it slipped by, I couldn't stop thinking about what Father Moon had said. I thought about what I might need to sacrifice for. From that day, the word sacrifice was engraved in my heart. Thinking back as the person called to live as the mother of peace, I realized that over time sacrifice became a name I could call myself. Mother of Peace. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Chapter 3 Part 2. God is my Father. From the time I could understand words, my maternal grandmother, Jo Won Mo, consistently taught me one thing, God is your Father. She went so far as to say, your mother is like your nanny who is raising you as God's daughter. Since I had been surrounded by an atmosphere of faith even while in my mother's womb, I accepted this without a second thought. When I heard the word God, my heart would open unreservedly and fill with warmth. Even as an adolescent in middle school, I poured my heart into quiet reading and study. I attended the Songjung Girls Middle School, located in Sajik Dong of Seoul's Jongno district. Situated at the southern foot of Mount Wang, it was a small school that seemed always bathed in sunlight. From the moment of its founding, that school shared in the suffering of the Korean people. It was established in May 1950, but had to close less than a month later due to the Korean War. After the war, its doors reopened and, true to its mission, 
the school prepared many girls to become talented women who would help build a prosperous country. In 1981, the school moved to the Umpyong district of Seoul, and in 1984, the spelling of its name was changed to Sunjin Girls Middle School. Our Tongil group acquired this school in 1987 and brought it into the Sunhak Academy family. I have continued to give it support and attention. In middle school I spoke little and developed a calm personality. I studied hard and always ranked at the top of my class. I was pretty and modest and, as I was also quiet and well-behaved, I received love and attention from my teachers. My school life was uneventful, I only remember that I missed a day or two of school in the first year when I became quite sick. In my second and third years, I received an award for earning the highest grades in my class. I preferred to read in a quiet spot and listen to music rather than engage in social life or sports. My hobby was drawing. I enjoyed art and had some talent, but set aside the possibility of becoming a professional artist. For all three years of middle school I was the class representative on the student council, and in the third year I was the head of the student steering committee. I led many student activities, and this awakened my leadership abilities. One day when the entire school was gathered, I went to the podium and announced the decisions of the student council. The teachers complimented me on my poise and confident attitude. After witnessing this side of me, which they had not seen before, the teachers commented, Hak Ja seems gifted, I thought she was just quiet and docile, but actually she shows good leadership skills. During adolescence, I didn't worry about my life or losing my way. I credit this to my grandmother and mother instilling in me a deep faith in God and the habit of living in attendance to Him. My mother, in particular, strictly guided my life of faith. Yes, there were times when I thought it difficult and wearisome, but I am grateful now, for it prepared me to blossom as the only begotten daughter of God who one day would meet the only begotten Son of God. Within that atmosphere, I grew roots of unshakable faith. I read a lot. I enjoyed reading tales of the saints, and particularly The Good Earth by Pearl S. Buck. The characters in that book struggle against nature and fate. The story helped me realize that ultimately we must return to nature's embrace, represented in this book by the earth. It is human nature to cling to God's embrace. I earnestly wish to be together with God, and for that reason I devoured songs and novels about the love of one's hometown. I knew from a young age that God was my father, and naturally connected everything I read to God. I cut off entirely from the harsh secular world and lived a chaste life as if I were a nun. I was aware that a higher power was guiding me, that my path had been prepared in heaven. I also read the Bible. I cried myself to sleep many nights after reading about God's history of creation, the tragic fall, and God's work of salvation, carried out through historical figures who took responsibility at the behest of heaven. I learned how they sacrificed themselves, and realized that God created us so he could love us as his children. After reading God's bitter history and his desire to embrace us, even though we give him only pain and sadness, it was not just once or twice that I lay awake, unable to sleep, my heart aching for him. I naturally continued to ponder ever more deeply what Father Moon had said to me about sacrifice. The question, what can I sacrifice for God, was shaping my life. Without sacrifice and service, one cannot even begin to think, one is living for the sake of others rather than for oneself. As I strictly cultivated my faith from a young age, I cherished a dream deep within my heart. That dream was to liberate my Heavenly Father who, throughout history, gave Himself for the salvation of humanity. I wished to free Him from the chains of our fallen history. We cannot meet God from a position of reigning over others. He finds us when we are silently working for the sake of those in greater difficulty than ourselves. I came to know that when we think about God's will from the lower position, God's bitterness washes away and He will come to us. During the post-war years, the streets were full of the wounded. Numerous children, including war orphans, were suffering from hunger and disease. Few people were able to get timely treatment when they became sick. I wanted to heal people's injuries, relieve their pain, and guide them to a brighter world. As it was time for me to enter high school, in the spring of 1959 I entered Street Joseph's Nursing School.
Mother of Peace. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Chapter 3 Part 3 Heavenly and Earthly Phoenixes In the late 1950s, it wasn't easy for a single mother. My mother managed to make ends meet by doing any odd job that came her way. She did not rest even a moment in her devoted life of prayer, and in that way she triumphed over those hardships and tribulations. One day, however, she announced to her small family, I've been living meaninglessly, I must live a life of greater value. She left me in the care of my maternal grandmother, and my uncle's wife and moved to Champadong Church and dedicated herself completely to church activities. She chose to take on the most menial of tasks. People would try to dissuade her, but she pursued such work with a joyful and grateful heart. She had lived a life of devoted faith in North Korea, greater than anyone, but started at the bottom in the Unification Church. She overworked herself, however, and her body grew weaker and weaker until she became seriously ill. Luckily, a lady she had known from the inside the womb church took her in. This person, Mrs. Oh Young Chun, was like a sister to her. They lived together in the Noryanjin neighborhood, and as they cared for each other, my mother gradually recovered her health. While at nursing school, I attended Chongpat Dong Church every Sunday. One day, when my mother saw me there, she took me to a corner and softly whispered, a few nights ago, I had a dream that was hard to understand. What did you dream? I asked. There were women from church wearing white holy robes and standing there holding pink flowers, she said. Then I saw you walking toward Teacher Moon. At that time, we called Father Moon Teacher. All of a sudden, thunder roared and lightning crashed from the sky and struck one spot. There you were, and other women all looked at you enviously. She paused, collecting her thoughts. That's when I woke up. I think it means that something will happen that will shake the world. I think so, too, I replied. I'm sure it is a prophetic dream, but I don't want to guess more than that. My mother did not imagine that this dream was a revelation from God, a prophecy that her only daughter would be called to become the true mother, who would give her life for the world. But I had been thinking constantly about the word sacrifice and had determined to live a life of sacrifice for God. This dream fit with that, and I had a sense of its meaning. In the late autumn of 1959, Father Moon conducted a national missionary workshop at the Chongpadong Church, and I participated with my mother. I was on one side of the overcrowded church, busy with the workshop, but could see that on the other side, elder sisters were quietly working on another important matter. A few months earlier, senior grandmothers of deep faith had begun preparations for Father Moon's marriage. They were considering which among the women of the church could be God's choice to be his bride. As I was only a schoolgirl and so much younger than Father Moon, my name would not have come up. Then one day, one of the sages among the grandmothers sought out Father Moon to tell him about her dream. I saw innumerable cranes flying down from the heavens, she told him, and even though I kept trying to shoo them away, they came and covered Teacher Moon. Father Moon provided no interpretation, so the elder sister continued with confidence, I believe my dream is revealing God's will, that your bride's name will include the Chinese character for Hawk, Crane. Shortly after I heard that, my mother told me another revelation she had received in prayer. A phoenix flew down from heaven, and another flew up from the earth to meet it. The phoenix from heaven was Father Moon. It brought to her mind her dream from years before, when she went to Daegu to meet Father Moon, the dream in which two golden dragons bowed down in the direction of Seoul. My mother thought about what all this might mean, and then one morning at dawn she received a heavenly message. She had just taken a cold shower, and it came as she was reciting the pledge prayer. The phoenix descending from heaven represents the true father, she announced, and the phoenix rising from the earth represents the true mother. My mother was happy with this understanding, but she continued quietly with the workshop and didn't speak about it. In the months following my 16th birthday, I matured quickly and it caught people's attention at church. Members would mention that I looked elegant and neat. I would hear someone say, Hakja is peaceful and virtuous. She is like a crane, just like her name. And another, she's also very polite, and if you watch, you will see she is very observant and has clear judgment. I stood out when I was with members of the congregation. People commented that I had an untainted purity, that I was one with God's will, 
and that I had embraced the virtue of obedience through the difficulties I had endured in North Korea. Hearing such comments, I disciplined myself not to feel proud or act carelessly. More than anything else, Father Moon was looking for a sacrificial and devoted heart of living for others. He did not care about family background, economic status, or appearance. She had to be a woman with absolute faith who could love the world. She had to be a woman who could conceive of saving the world. Because he had been unable to find such a woman, there had been no marriage of the Lamb. He still did not fully know that the heavenly bride, who would become the mother of heaven, earth, and humankind, was close by. I had come to understand God's will, but was unable to say anything. To recognize the bride was Father Moon's mission and responsibility. Mother of Peace. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Chapter 3 Part 4. I Became the Heavenly Bride. A short time later, Mrs. Oh Young Chun, the devout member who had taken in my mother, went to her job in a clothing store on the second floor of the Nakwon building in Central Seoul. She assisted the store owner at making garments. The owner was a longtime member we called the prayer grandmother. When Mrs. O oh arrived, the owner was sewing together a man's suit. Mrs. O oh sat next to her as she pumped the wheel of the sewing machine, and asked casually, Oh, who is the suit for? This suit is for Father Moon was the grandmother's answer. He is going to wear it at his engagement ceremony. Mrs. O oh perked up immediately, and her eyes widened as she asked the natural question, Who is to be the bride? Well, replied the grandmother nonchalantly, the day of the engagement has been decided, but the bride hasn't been chosen yet. However, the ceremony is going to be held soon, and so I am making his suit. Mrs. O's mind was buzzing. Who is going to be the bride? She pondered the question but couldn't come up with any possibilities. Mrs. O was a person who often heard God's voice in revelations. In fact, she had been offering prayerful devotions for seven years for the sake of the appearance of the True Mother. She right away took her question to God in prayer, and she received a revelation, because Eve fell when she was 16 years old, the Heavenly Bride needs to be younger than 20. This had never occurred to her before. It was only then that she understood the logic of God's will. She asked God again and again, who is the Heavenly Bride who is younger than 20? And before long, she thought of me. I know Hak Jahan, who is around 16, she said to herself. She often sits right next to me in church. Why didn't I think of her? Could it really be her? At 10 o'clock that evening, Mrs. O was making her way home after finishing her work. She was on the Nori engine bus as it was crossing the Han River when God spoke to her, It will be Hak Jah. It will be Hak Jah. God's revelation descended upon Mrs. O like a wave of energy in the autumn night sky. She arrived in her neighborhood around 11 p.m., but instead of going home, she hurried to see my mother, who lived near her. Sumei, are you sleeping? Not yet. Come in. How old is your daughter? My mother gave her a puzzled look. Mrs. O oh had skipped all formalities and asked the point-blank question. Why are you visiting me in the middle of the night to ask me how old my daughter is? Don't change the subject, please just tell me. She's 16, turning 17 next year. When is her birthday? She was born in 1943, on the sixth day of the first lunar month. She has the same birthday as our master. Why are you suddenly asking me such questions? Mrs. O and my mother were old friends. They were the same age, and they had attended the same church in their hometown in North Korea. In addition, their mothers were very close friends. My mother, in fact, was living in Nori Engine, across the street from Mrs. O. Oh. Mrs. O oh had found this place for my mother when she had fallen into poor health while doing her church work. Just as abruptly as she had arrived, Mrs. O oh bid my mother good night and departed, leaving my mother to figure out what was on her mind. The next day, as soon as it became light, Mrs. O oh was on her way back to work at the Nakwan building. 
God's revelation about me completely distracted her and the workday came and went without her realizing what she was doing. When she finished her work, she went directly to see a fortune teller. To this day, Koreans often consult fortune tellers for guidance about marriage, and that's what Mrs. Oh did. She described to the fortune teller the two persons about whom she was consulting, without mentioning their names. Right away the fortune teller's eyes widened. There may be a large gap between the ages of these two persons, but it doesn't matter. They are a match made in heaven. I have rarely seen such a couple whose fortunes are so aligned. Mrs. O felt her heart was about to explode. She calmed herself and went directly to the church to meet our teacher and tell him everything. As soon as she gained a private space with him, she blurted it out, Hak Ja Han, the daughter of Hong Soon A, is the heavenly bride. She waited for a response, but Father Moon didn't say a word. He had listened to many members suggest who might be his bride, and none of them paid much attention to me. I did not worry about that. I kept my mind on heaven. I knew then, and know now, that a person's destiny is not contingent upon external evidence. God is the judge, and it is predestined that the only begotten son will marry the only begotten daughter prepared by God, and that this is in the hands of God. I knew it was Father Moon's mission and duty to recognize the only begotten daughter. I may have been young in years, but my heart toward God was unwavering. I waited for the time. One day not long after that, hearing the sound of a magpie sitting on the branch of a tree near the window of my dormitory room, I had a premonition that I was about to receive good news. I went to the window, opened it, looked up toward the sky, and I heard God's voice. Those were days in which God was giving me revelations not only in my dreams but also like waves coming down from the clear, blue sky. I heard the words, the time is near. It was the voice of God. I had heard it often since I was a child. I had always felt that I would meet a very precious person one day. As if someone were pushing me, I closed my books and left the dormitory. Something was telling me that my mother was not feeling well. As I was crossing the Han River on the bus, many thoughts flooded my mind. Does crossing the river mean that I am crossing over to a different world from the one in which I have been living? How many stories are embraced by the river, swirling beneath its confidently flowing surface? Is the heart of God, who is searching for us, like this river? I got off the bus and started walking up the Nori Engine Hill toward my house. As I climbed the slope, an unusually bright winter sun drew me onward in spite of the wind from the Han River blowing against my forehead. When my mother saw me, she did not seem at all unwell, she looked rather excited and gratified to see me arrive. My confusion as to what drew me home dissipated right away, as she held the door open and quickly put on her coat. I have received a message from the church, she told me. We have to go there right now. To me, it was a given that the news that awaited us at the church, whatever it might be, had been prepared by God. The scene of my first meeting with Father Moon, which was just after I had finished elementary school, passed before me like a panoramic vision. I recalled the dream I had had after that meeting. Father Moon appeared in it with a young and gentle face, and I clearly heard God's revelation, prepare, for the time is near. Recalling this strict command from heaven, walking toward the church, I surrendered myself completely, with a heart filled with trust in my Heavenly Father. Until now I have lived according to your will, I said to Heavenly Parent in prayer, whatever be your will and providence, I am one with it already. Because I knew God's sorrowful grief, a courage based on my faith in God rose up within me. I felt I could gratefully accept whatever might be asked of me. Then I heard God's voice again. I felt the same presence that I felt in the upper room of the Inside the Womb Church, when Grandmother Hio anointed me, and when the monk passing by our house had prophesied about me. Bathed in that presence, I heard the words, Mother of the Universe. The time has come. It was like the sound of a gong reverberating in the air. The voice spoke again. I am the Alpha and the Omega, and I have been waiting for the Mother of the Universe since the creation of the world. When I heard those words, I knew what my future was to be, and it settled in my heart and created an ocean of calm. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve talked with God directly and heard God's words with their own ears. I had had such direct conversations with God from a young age. I continued walking, going to church while holding my mother's hand, as I had done so many times before. 
My mother and I arrived at the Chongpa Dong Church. It was February 26, 1960, a day when winter was withdrawing and spring was signaling its advent. Father Moon met with my mother and me all day in order to come to a conclusion about the Heavenly Bride. He and I talked about many things over the course of nine hours. At his request, I drew him a picture. I spoke clearly as I answered his questions about my hopes and aspirations. Remembering how Jacob received God's blessing at Bethel, I happily, yet seriously, said to him, I will bear many heavenly children. What God told Jacob at Bethel came into my mind, and thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south, and in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. I determined that I would engraft onto our couple all of humankind in heaven and on earth, making them into God's good children. When Isaac went up Mount Moriah with Abraham to offer a sacrifice, he asked his father where the offering was. Abraham answered that God had prepared a sacrifice, and said nothing more. With that, Isaac, even at his young age, could understand the situation and realize that he was the sacrifice to be offered to heaven. Just as Isaac obediently lay upon the altar, I knew that God had prepared me as the heavenly bride and that this was God's predestined providence. I had no questions or doubt in my heart, I had only the desire to keep going on the path. I accepted God's command in a state of complete selflessness. On our way back home from this extraordinary day, my mother looked at me with warm eyes. You are usually so meek and calm, I didn't know you could be so bold. I reflected on the fact that the holy wedding is not based on how bold a person is. In order to multiply God's lineage, the true mother has to bear many good children, and therefore she would have to marry in her teens. Such a bride should be of a patriotic family, I realized as well, with a life of faith inherited over three generations. Three years before that, a number of single women believers had put themselves forward as marriage candidates before Father Moon. Several around the age of 30, in particular, had high hopes, as Father Moon himself was nearing 40. Even in that circumstance, and having publicly announced the date of the holy wedding, Father Moon had maintained silence. He was waiting on heaven to decide who would be his bride. He knew that God is the one to prepare the only begotten daughter. Only God can confirm the bride for whom the marriage supper of the Lamb is conducted. God alone knows who is to become the mother of the universe and the mother of peace. For the salvation of all of humankind and realization of a world of peace, I determined myself and declared before Father Moon that I would rise to the position of the true parent. I accepted Father Moon as the only begotten son for the accomplishment of our heavenly parents' will. It was God's call to me to become the heavenly bride and the mother of the universe. I knew that my path would be unimaginably difficult. Yet I pledged I would live for God and absolutely fulfill my mission to save the world. I pledged before God and Father Moon, no matter how difficult the path may be, I will complete God's providence of restoration during my lifetime. And then I pledged one more time, I will do whatever it takes to fulfill our Heavenly Parents' will. I have defined and lived my life with that commitment. The course of human events is often unpredictable. Church members were so astonished when the news spread that Father Moon had chosen Hak Jahan, that 17-year-old nursing student, to be his bride. Some people thought it was a false rumor. Some were taken aback. Some rejoiced, others were jealous. I remembered Father Moon's words from four years before, you will need to make sacrifices in the future, and I knew that each day was going to be a learning experience concerning what that meant. When my maternal grandmother's ancestor Johan Jun showed sincere loyalty and devotion to his country, he received the revelation, I will send to your lineage the princes of God. In return for my ancestor's devotion, his sacrifice with no desire for recognition, God chose our family to exemplify the tradition of loyalty and filial piety. My mother was born to my grandmother, who had deep piety, and I was born to my mother. I trace God's will to send to the world his only begotten daughter, which has borne fruit through me, back to my ancestor Johan Jun. To fulfill my mission as God's only begotten daughter, I have a firm belief in unflinching will for the sake of every nation, every religion, every race. Going beyond all fallen world boundaries, I am called to reconcile nations and races with benevolence and love. I am called to be like the ocean that accepts and absorbs the water of all rivers, big and small alike. 
Embodying our God who is our Heavenly Mother as well as Heavenly Father, I am called to embrace all who are lost and have no one to receive them, with the heart of a parent. I set these things in my flesh and blood, in my beating heart, and have not for one second forgotten the will that God entrusted to me. Sixty years have passed since our holy wedding, and my husband is now not with us physically. More than ever, no matter what my age or physical condition may be, my beating heart drives me forward on the path to become the mother of the universe and the mother of peace, one in mind, one in body, one in heart and one in harmony with the one who guides the providence. Mother of Peace And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Chapter 3 Part 4 I became the Heavenly Bride, 